Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I had just finished up a long day at work and was looking forward to relaxing at home. As I pulled into my driveway, I noticed something was off. My car wasn't there. Confused, I got out and looked around, thinking maybe I had parked somewhere else by mistake. But no, my spot was empty. That's when I saw the letter taped to my front door. It was from the homeowners association of my neighborhood, stating that my car had been towed for violating homeowners association parking guidelines. I was furious. The audacity of them to tow my car from my own driveway. I wasn't even part of their homeowners association. You see, I owned the land before the neighborhood was developed. When the construction company approached me about buying part of my property to build houses, I agreed, but with one condition that my parcel would remain outside of the homeowners association. I value my independence and didn't want to deal with a bunch of uppity rule followers telling me what to do. The company reluctantly agreed, and over the next couple years, the houses went up around my little plot of land. The people who moved into the homeowners association houses were friendly enough at first, but it didn't take long before the power-hungry homeowners association board members started throwing their weight around. They sent out pages and pages of rules involving things like Christmas light colors, lawn ornament regulations, and acceptable paint shades. I just tossed the packets right into recycling. After all, their rules didn't apply to me, or so I thought. This BS with my car proved they were overstepping their bounds. Still fuming, I called the tow company to find out where my car had been taken. After paying the exorbitant impound fee, I headed over to retrieve my car. The tow truck driver, sensing my anger, cautiously asked what happened. I explained the situation and he just shook his head. Yeah, this homeowners association has been out of control lately. I've had to tow nearly a dozen cars for them this month over minor violations. Don't know who they think they are, he said. This gave me an idea. If the homeowners association wanted to use the tow company to strong-arm residents into following their policies, then I would fight fire with fire. After getting my car back, I drove to the Homeowners Association board president's house and carefully parked in his driveway, making sure not to block it in any way. The next morning, I sat in my car down the street and watched with glee as the tow truck backed into the president's driveway. The shrill sound of the winch pulling his shiny BMW onto the flatbed was sweet music to my ears. Within minutes, the pristine car was hauled away. I drove over and slid a copy of the letter they left me under his front door. Your vehicle has been towed for violating parking guidelines, it read. Ian, later that day, I got an angry phone call from the president demanding I move my car immediately. I politely informed him that I would not be doing so, as I was not bound by homeowners association rules. If he wanted to get his car back, he could pay the fine to the tow company. After all, rules are rules, right? This back and forth went on for weeks. Each time the homeowners association had my car towed, I would return the favor and park in one of the board members' spots. It was an epic game of malicious compliance. The hapless tow truck driver began greeting me by name. Who's the victim today? He'd joke as I led him to my next target. The homeowners association started sending increasingly threatening letters, claiming I was not exempt from their policies. I responded by taping copies of my original land agreement, highlighting the clause that maintained my independence. Things finally came to a head at one of the Homeowners Association's community meetings. As I walked in, the room fell silent. The board members glared at me with unconcealed contempt. When the floor opened up for concerns, I stepped forward and gave them a piece of my mind. I called out their bullying tactics, selective rule enforcement, and blatant overreach. Other residents in the room nodded and muttered in agreement. Emboldened, a few even described Homeowners Association harassment they had faced. The president tried to regain control, stating they were simply trying to maintain order and aesthetic appeal. I shot back that going around towing people's cars left and right did the exact opposite. Sensing the growing outrage against them, the board quickly wrapped up the meeting. As people shuffled out, several came up to thank me for standing up to the homeowners association. News of the ongoing parking war had spread, and many were eager to share their own homeowners association horror stories. A week later, I received a letter from the Homeowners Association board requesting a meeting. I agreed, but brought along a lawyer just in case. Turns out, all the backlash from residents had made the board scared. 
people were refusing to pay homeowners association dues and threatening to vote the members out. They proposed a truce. If I dropped my crusade against them, they would completely exempt my property from any homeowners association oversight going forward. After making them put it in writing and having my lawyer review, I accepted. These days, the homeowners association sticks to maintaining the common areas and organizing community events. They seem to have realized that constantly harassing residents was not a good look. I'm just glad I was able to stand my ground against their bullying and enact a little malicious compliance of my own. Goes to show you don't have to take crap from homeowners associations, even if you're outnumbered. The next one is a pro-revenge story. There was a woman, let's call her Stacy. Stacy owned a bar, Stacy has a great personality, knows how to make drinks, and successfully ran a bar. Stacy is a young, attractive, ambitious woman. Unfortunately for Stacy, after she built up her bar, her husband emptied her bank account and ran off with all the money. This devastated Stacy, and she didn't have the funds or will power to move forward. So she sold the bar and started to live off the sale of the bar. Stacy improved herself a lot. Stacy and I were friends, not best friends, but we knew each other. I knew Stacy was starting to run out of money because she had mentioned this several times in Facebook postings. Well, I'm friends with quite a few business people, and over the course of the last several months, I recommended businesses to her to go apply for a job. After the first recommendation, she thanked me, applied, and got the job. She quit that job, that's fine. I recommend her another job sometime later. She thanked me, things didn't work out with that interview hiring. Life, right? Two weeks ago, a bar starts looking for a manager. Their offer is really competitive, high salary, profit sharing, etc. I tell Stacy about this bar, and this is copied and pasted, only edited parts are the names. Club A is looking to hire a bar manager, they want experience, offer a good salary, plus profit sharing. Go to their Facebook page for more info. That's it. Our messages for the past several months only had to about jobs. All very short, all very to the point. Three days later, she responds, I'm sick and tired of you stalking me. I'm not into you. Stop messaging me. I qualify this that she meant this for me, and not someone else. She confirms it's about me stalking her and how much of a pervert I am, apparently. I stop responding. Did I mention I'm good friends with bar owner from Club A? I asked him if Stacy had applied. He said she had and it's between her and another guy. I said, let me show you our FB conversation and maybe that will help you make up your mind. So I hand him my phone. After reading it, he says, I don't think I want a woman like this working for me. She did not get the job. She did not get the job. The next one is a petty revenge story. My ex-wife and I were standing in line at the airport of our honeymoon destination, waiting to get checked in and return home. There was quite a bit of a line already, but we were lucky enough to find ourselves near the front of it. When there was only one couple in front of us, two fancy-looking ladies, think Hyacinth Bucket, marched in between the two lines to the front and smugly stood between the lines, being sure their important looks would get them served first. They tried to cut in front of the couple ahead of us, but the young couple was quicker and was able to block the older ladies their path with a surfboard and got checked in. The looks trown left and right to everyone around from these ladies were dripping of the contempt for the young couple and everyone else in line. The two praying mantises at this point start eyeballing me and my ex-wife because we are now their competition for the two M-dash to the desk. They, ever so slightly, start shuffling forward to get a bit closer. At this point, the accumulated stress of traveling and my lack of patience with entitled people was getting the better of me, so I asked what they thought they were doing, and that the back of the line is, well, at the back of the line. The head Karen, although perfectly capable of understanding and speaking English, resorts to saying a few demeaning-sounding things in her Slavic language and proceeds to look me up and down like a piece of crap. Now don't get me wrong, I am a piece of crap, but that doesn't mean she gets to look at me with that much disgust. So instead of continuing the non-existent conversation in English, I switched to my dialect so she can have a taste of her own medicine. I calmly said a few choice sentences to her, carefully picking my words to make it sound as horrible as possible, fully realizing that only my ex-wife is capable of understanding me, and that my dialect sounds like someone having a horrible stroke, 
which seemed to make secondary Karen realize it wasn't worth it, and she, kind of ashamed, started tugging on head Karen her sleeve to move to the back of the line. Some more things were said by her, some more dirty looks trown, but they retreated to the end of the line and we got checked in. I am sitting in the plane's middle row, aisle seat, and who walks in? The two Karens. We spot each other, glares from her, grins from me, and it turns out head Karen her seat is the one behind me. From the moment we were off the ground, I reclined my seat all the way back. Having dinner like an ancient Roman, if only they could have hanged my meal from the ceiling so I could have picked it like grapes of a vine. Four HRs into the flight or so, my back started to hurt, but I knew I wasn't going to let it stop me. I'll just stretch it out, unlike her legs, and sit out the remaining two HRs of the flight. No looks were given by her when we left the plane, and as someone who never reclines their seat, I felt like a boss for having gone through with it all the way to the end. The next one is a malicious compliance story. A few years ago, I parked in a paid parking lot but forgot to buy a parking ticket. When I came back a few minutes later, I discovered an $80 ticket on my dash. While I was frustrated about my own forgetfulness, the ticket itself was fair. However, I came to discover that the amount they had charged me was not. Before leaving the lot, I noticed a small detail on the terms and conditions sign at the entrance of the lot. It said that a failure to pay for a parking ticket would result in a $70 ticket, not the $80 that I was charged. While I'm no lawyer, I do know that those signs essentially create an implicit contract upon entering the lot. Therefore, the company was technically violating their own contract by charging me extra. I appealed the ticket, stating that I would be happy to pay the agreed-upon $70, but it was rejected. I then reached out directly to customer service, explaining the same situation. They rejected my request to pay the valid $70 because their ticket amounts are non-negotiable. Cue the malicious compliance. I realized that by their own words, they are the ones attempting to negotiate the price by charging me an extra $10. So I called up the supervisor of their claims department. She was already aware of this dispute and immediately attempted to shut me down, saying, the signage is not up for discussion. I reminded her that their company's policy states that ticket amounts are non-negotiable, and that given what the terms on the sign stated, they were trying to negotiate a higher price. Once again, she shut me down, stating the signage is not up to discussion. The rest of the conversation went something like this. Me. So where can I escalate this from here? Her. There is no more escalation. Next stage is court. Me. Seems silly to go to court over $10, don't you think? Her. Yeah, it does. Me. Okay, well, I'll begin the small claims court process over the non-negotiable price issue then. Her. Okay. I was having fun at this point and was fully ready to start taking legal steps over this $10 on a matter of principle, and knowing that if I did, the company would immediately cave. Before doing that, however, I sent one final email to the vice president of the company. I explained the whole dispute, explaining the signage, their non-negotiable policy, and how the appeals supervisor told me my next step was to take it to court. I offered them the opportunity to resolve this civilly before going on to that stage. Not even three hours later, I got an email back, stating that my ticket had been fully cleared as a courtesy. I called their bluff, maliciously complying to the contract and the take-it-to-court attitude, and it worked. As an added bit of pettiness, I replied thanking them and cc'd the appeal supervisor. I then directly addressed her, telling her that this is how easy it could have been resolved if she would have actually addressed the signage issue. The moral of this story. Push back against parking lot companies. They use shady practices and try to scare people into paying unjustly. Often a simple but credible legal threat will make any issue disappear. The next one is an entitled people story. My younger sister went through a pretty rough time as a young adult, drinking and doing drugs and generally being wild. She ended up getting pregnant and giving birth at age 18 when I was just a few weeks away from turning 21. She did not want the child after giving birth. She refused to even pick up the child and would leave her sitting in dirty nappies. Despite never wanting children myself either, I stepped in and adopted my newborn niece as my daughter, my then boyfriend who I'd been with for three years, gave me an ultimatum him or her as he didn't want children either. I picked her, and he left me which resulted in me suddenly being a single mother. The first few years were rough as a single parent, barely making ends meet. But I managed, 
and my sister had nothing to do with us. I never once hid the truth from my daughter that she was adopted, but always assured her I loved her so much and was her mummy. When my daughter was six, my sister was finally clean and wanted to have access to her. I allowed it but stressed she would just be an aunt to her, and she accepted this, though it's clear she struggled with the concept and sometimes acted more like a mother, which I always squashed quickly. Now my daughter is eight, and I've been offered a job in a different country. The pay is almost double my current salary, and the company is helping us find a home, putting my daughter in an international school and after-school care. So of course I'm going to take it, but this resulted in my family having a meltdown about how I can't do this, and how it's cruel to take my daughter away from her family, and how it's not fair to my sister. My sister has told me she won't allow me move away with her, and that she'll fight in court to get my daughter back. I've talked to lawyers, and it seems she doesn't have a leg to stand on as my daughter is legally my daughter, but the rest of my family is telling me I'm being extremely cruel, and if I cared about my sister, I'd turn this job down. I left home at 16 and finished my education. My sister, meanwhile, is the golden child who gets away with everything. She even now lives with our parents and doesn't work. My daughter, while sad to be leaving her school and friends, is excited for the move, I've been teaching her about the country every night before bed, and we've gone to some authentic restaurants to try food from there. I've also promised her we'll fly back at least once a year to visit, and she can FaceTime and call her friends. I feel like my family are angling for me to eventually just hand my daughter back over, as if I was just a temporary filler for my sister, which will obviously never happen, and my lawyers are involved in this matter. The next one is an entitled parent story. So my grandma gave me this cookbook that has been passed down four generations in the family, making me the fifth to have it. She gave it to me when I got a house and started university, ten years ago. My auntie was in the room when it was given, too. My one cousin was jealous because she thought she deserved it, as I didn't spend as much time with grandma living far away. If Hitler, Stalin, and Martha Stewart had a threesome, my auntie is the product. She's the most emotionally abusive person I've ever met, and hates my mom for finding real love and remarrying after she got divorced. She expected my mom never to even date again like her? Well, in December, my, my grandma passed away on my birthday. She was my idol and role model, and she loved me and I loved her so dearly. I was the last person she remembered before her Alzheimer's took over completely. Well, not even three days later, I find out my auntie is looking for this book, and demands it so she can make copies for the entire family. My oldest cousin thinks it's her birthday right. And my other girl cousin just had a baby, so she thinks she deserves it, so she can pass it down to her little girl, because I can't have kids. I'm having a hysterectomy this next month. I've told them all to duck off. Grandma gave this to me ten years ago, before she got sick. Before I got sick. Not that that matters. She gave it to me and I don't have to give it over to anyone for any reason. Not even roommates were allowed to touch this book. None of them are speaking to me now, and I'm really ducking mad. I'm so disappointed over their entitled feelings and throwing it at me that I can't have kids. I turned 27 the day my grandma died. I want kids. I just can't medically have them. No one is getting this book. She gave it to me, and she was the only person to ever accept me as family. I miss my grandma. I wish I understood the meaning of family. What's written sounds bizarre to me, and I want to feel those good feelings. Just to clarify, I'm hurt because they won't speak to me. They're speaking to everyone else instead of me. I haven't heard once from this auntie, but she said everything to my mom and hurt my mom so much more, and my mom had to relay it to me thinking I'd stole the cookbook because my mom and I weren't talking when my grandma gave me the book ten years ago. So I either never told her or it was so minor back then she forgot I had it. I don't have any respect for people who talk to others about a problem, but not to the person who is the only one that can rectify the problem. She shouldn't have involved my mom. The next one is an entitled parent's story. My brother and his psycho wife asked me the other day to babysit their children, and I said no. I work a 9-to-5 job and do extracurricular stuff afterwards, that's more important. To which his psycho wife said, You're going to babysit your nephew and nieces because we're on our way to your place right now, and you're just going to have to ducking deal with it. Which I then replied, go ahead and try, and promptly got in my car and left my place of residence and did not come back until later. I already had things to do. The next morning, my neighbor next door said that a woman was at my door with her baby and two little girls for an hour and a half knocking on the doors and windows, just trying to get in. 
to which I called my brother and was absolutely livid and told him to not let his wife do that crap. Turns out they wanted me to watch the kids so they could go bar hopping until 2 a.m. and not have me return their children until 10 a.m. I've told him and my family I'm child-free. Everyone seems to leave me alone about it except for this idiot. She has legit called me irresponsible and a man-child for not wanting to have kids when I first told my family about it. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.